So one of my YouTube followers, or subscribers rather, asked me if I'd make a video on this subject, and on the Dr. D University channel, as long as it's within my intellectual capability, ask and you shall receive. So we're going to talk about transaction cost economics versus bounded rationality. What is the relationship between these two concepts? So in order to answer that question, we'll first do a quick review of transaction cost economics, and then I'll talk about bounded rationality. I want you to think about this for a second, and I'll draw it out in a second, don't worry, but let's just think about it conceptually, and we're going to talk about transaction cost economics first. Every firm or company has to make a decision on whether they produce a good or service in-house, i.e. by companies who are full-time employees, or do they contract that good or service out onto the open market. Okay? I'm going to draw this out for a second. I'm going to draw a matrix style organization for you. Now, some of you may be thinking, the matrix, are we going to take the red pill or the blue pill? We're not talking about that kind of matrix. Okay? We're talking about something very different. So what you normally have at the top, board of directors. Board of directors are designed to represent the interests of the owners, i.e. stockholders. Okay. And who works for the board of directors? If you said the CEO, you got that right. Okay, I know that sometimes the CEO is also the chairman of the board of directors, you know, whatever. We're not going to get into that right now. If you'd like to know more about that, check out my playlist on corporate governance. But, you know, we're keeping it simple. Okay? CEO, of course, has their functional staff, also known as a C suite. COO, Chief Operating Officer, CHRO, Chief Human Resources Officer, CFO, Finance, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And beneath, this, okay? You have a variety of strategic business units. And these strategic business units ideally could be standalone businesses if they had to be. There's another way to draw this, I'm going to draw it in a second. But, for purposes of simplicity, let's look at it this way. So, you've got product or service A, B, C, D, and E. Think of it like maybe a car manufacturing company, okay? Unit A makes the tires, unit B makes the windshields, unit C makes the engines, D makes the body, and E puts it all together. Okay? But you know what? I wonder. Here's the thing that we've got to ask, and we're going to give transaction cost economics a little bit of a, a spin here. Actually, let me get a different color pen for purposes of illustration here. I like purple. I don't know if you guys do. It's one of my favorite colors. Okay? Let's say, what did I say this was? Putting it all together and then the body? Let's say we say, you know, I wonder if I could contract the assembly of all the parts and the making of the body to a contractor. Because right now, it's employees of the company that's doing all, these, all this stuff. I wonder if I could contract that out. Well, there's a kind of a simple set of calculations you can make. Yes, you can put way more into the numbers here than I'm illustrating. I'm just trying to keep it simple for purposes of illustration. Okay? So... How can I calculate this? Well, first of all, you can make a little bit of a comparison. How much of the materials for whatever good or service you're producing? Okay, so I'm talking about the body and the assembly. Well, let's just do the body first. Okay, I have aluminum, steel, whatever you use in an automobile body. I have those kinds of supplies. I have access to those supply chains. Is it cheaper for me to use my supply chains? Or is it cheaper, maybe a contracting company or a third party has their own supply chains and maybe that's cheaper? Okay, maybe. You normally add labor. Okay, I wonder if it's cheaper per hour for me to pay people that, to work for me or can a contracting company maybe do it with fewer employees or do they pay their laborers less? Now, this is important when you're looking at unionized labor, right? Let's 
you may want to consider contracting out if you're having to do a labor unit. Okay? So we look at the cost of labor next. We might look at the transportation cost. Okay? Transportation. So in other words, you know, if I send all of these parts to China to have it all put together along with the body, is it cheaper for me to make the stuff in Detroit and then have it shipped to like my customers in Ohio, or is it cheaper for me to ship the stuff all the way to China and then back? Okay? So these are pretty easy calculations so far, right? I mean, my materials versus material, and I'm, I'm using China as an example, because we always talk about, you know, we outsource an offshore to China or, or you know, whatever. Okay? Is it cheap? How are the materials cost here versus in China? Okay? Pretty objective stuff, right? What about the labor costs? I can measure that as well. Maybe I've got 100 laborers in China doing the work, and I've only got 10 here, but I've got to pay the 10 here way more than you'd pay for 100 in China. Okay? Again, you can calculate that. And then the transportation cost, right? You can calculate that. Okay? And it's not just transportation of the, fi the finished good, but it could be shipping of any of the value chain, you know, etc. So is it cheaper for me to ship all the stuff to China and have it come back? Or, you know, how does that look? And you would add these things up, and you get kind of a preliminary number. Okay? But here's the tricky one, and this is the whole point of transaction cost economics. You also need to add in search costs versus satisficing behavior. Okay? Search costs versus satisficing behavior. This is the this is the whole reason that transaction cost economics even exists. So let's talk first about search costs, okay? Let's say that my automobile company, you know what, the, it is so expensive to produce an automobile body and it is so expensive to put all that stuff together, okay? It's expensive on the, and let's just use the automobile body because it's, you know, keep it simple. The materials that aluminum steel, I, I just can't get it cheaply here in the United States. I just can't, okay? And I'll tell you, I'm having to deal with unions, and the labor is killing me. Now, I am pretty close to my target market, so my transportation is not really that bad. You know, I'm making the cars in Detroit, I'm shipping it to Ohio, other places in the U.S., it's really not all that bad. Okay, fine. You know what? I want to see how much it's going to cost to have a Chinese company manufacture the body and also... Um, Put the stuff together too, right? Fine. The materials, the labor, the transportation, let's say all of that, it looks like it's cheaper at first. But it's the search cost that's the hard part, right? Search cost means how long is it going to take me to find a suitable supplier or a suitable partner to do the making the body and or assembling it? How long? And the time that I spend trying to find that ideal supplier is time that I could be spending doing something else. That time has a cost. You need to add that calculation here. Okay. Now the flip side to this argument is the fact that, well, actually, the search cost can be weighed against the fact that within the market, you always get the ideal, best price, best quality, best, best, best. Everything's the best because you're, you're looking at thousands and thousands of competitors. Why can't you get the best price and the best quality within a firm? The reason is satisficing behavior. Not satisfying, satisficing. And when you look at these employees here within the firm, you see they've already been hired. They don't have to be the best that they can be they just have to be good enough not to get fired. That is satisficing behavior. You don't have to be at your best. You have to be just good enough not to get fired. What does that mean? Well, it means that maybe you take a little bit longer with the bathroom break. 
And by the way, while I'm on the bathroom break, the company is paying me to use the bathroom. And maybe I take an extra smoke break. And maybe I go home a little bit earlier. I come in a little bit late. Or, you know, I am putting the body together, but, you know, I'm not really hammering as hard as I could, right? And, yeah, I'm assembling the stuff, but, you know, whatever. Okay? That is satisficing behavior. And that has a cost, too. Okay? So, which offsets which in comparison to the rest of this equation? Is it cheaper for me to go out of the market and waste a bunch of time trying to get bids and the suitable suppliers? Or am I better off using people that I've got in-house, even though they might be a little bit lazy and not as good as they can be? And by the way, this searching doesn't just mean that once you find them that the search cost ends, right? I remember hearing this story about a, a, an automobile manufacturer, and they said, wow, we can outsource everything to China, and that'll be great. So they outsource everything in their production out to China, including the assembly. Came back. You know, you had steering wheels that didn't fit with the chassis, tires that didn't fit with wheels. I mean, all sorts of weird stuff, right? And so what winds up happening? They've got to redo all of those cars. They've wasted the materials. They've wasted the time finding that crap supplier. They've got to waste time again finding a suitable supplier. And in fact, in this case, they wound up just rehiring the, the American laborers. You know, so redo the cars. You lose the materials. You've got to get new materials. You've got to hire new employees. All of that goes right back in here to search costs. Okay? So, in their case, they decided they'd rather hire the American workers who might not be, in theory, as efficient as the, you know, efficient in a market sense, you know, cheaper or whatever, as the, the laborers were in China, but at least the stuff was done to their specifications, right? And, you know, that's, that's kind of a decision that you, you've got to be able to make. I mean, some people also argue that control could also go under satisfying behavior, the cost of monitoring people to make sure that it's done right. You know, that can also be part of it. But this is, the, this is the principle. I've given it in kind of a simple way. You can also look at the firm as a value chain if you don't like this matrix-style organization. Some people call a firm a value chain. You don't even draw out this stuff. You just draw out a series of value-added activities. All right. So you don't even look at the CEO, you just say, this firm takes wheels, sticks them on um, axles with tires, body, and assembles the whole thing. And again, you can look, and you can do the same kind of calculation for each step in a value chain, because maybe it's cheaper to do tires out on the open market, but not for the body, not for the chassis, not for the engine, right? So each one of these, you can make this calculation. You just got to remember, you've got to be able to weigh out how long it takes you to find the suitable supplier, because that has a cost. Even though, in theory, that best supplier is out there, it takes time to find that best supplier. It's not like in economics where we have perfect access to information at all times, versus people not engaging in utility optimizing behavior, to use an economics term, right? People engage in satisfying behavior, okay? These are things that you need to weigh. Okay, now to the question you asked about bounded rationality. This is the second part, okay? Bounded rationality, just like, so you have to remember, transaction cost economics is basically a, a perversion of regular economics. It's disputing everything you learned in econ class, okay? Because as I mentioned, under class, neoclassical economics, they say that customers make perfectly rational decision, have, decisions and have access to perfect information at all times. Search cost says no, that's not true. And with the satisficing behavior, economics says that individuals maximize their utility and they make the best decisions for themselves at all times. Satisficing behavior disputes that as well. Bounded rationality likewise builds upon this. I wouldn't say builds upon it, but it's a corollary concept. That individuals do not make the best decisions at all time, and it, it kind of clarifies it a little bit. I usually think of bounded rationality as looking at individually bounded rationality, although you can, you can apply the same thing to an organization, whereas search costs, the way they present transaction cost economics, I think could apply to either the individual or to the organization. But anyhow, bounded rationality. 
Individuals don't always make the best decisions, and they don't make the best decisions for two reasons. They don't have proper time or resources, or they don't have the intellectual capabilities to do it. Okay? Let me give an example. Tying it back to search costs. Okay? You do not have an infinite amount of time to find that perfect supplier. Right? You just don't have the time. That is a time constraint, which can also be considered a financial constraint. So what do you do? You make the best decision within a lot of time period. Your boss says you got three days to find the perfect supplier. You will find probably not the perfect supplier, but you'll find the best one that you could find in three days. Maybe there'd be a better one if you had five days, but you didn't have five days. You had three days. Okay, that's part of bounded rationality. Okay, that's a time constraint. A resource constraint. Okay, maybe um, there is a better supplier out there, um, but you don't necessarily have the manpower to look for it. That's kind of like a time constraint. Like you've only got five managers that are going to help you find that better supplier. You know, maybe if you had seven managers, you could find an even better one, but you've got this resource constraint, which is kind of like a time constraint. Okay? Five managers working for three days is not going to give you the same results as seven managers working for three days on a problem. Right? That's a resource constraint. And then there's also the intellectual constraint with bounded rationality. Sometimes we're just not smart enough or we don't have the knowledge to, to evaluate that perfect decision. Let's say that I was the CEO of an auto, automobile company. And an engineer tells me, you know something? If I give you this equation, that'll tell you the perfect thing for this tire. I'm not an engineer. I have to trust that that engineer knows what he or she is doing. Okay? That's also bounded rationality, because as a CEO, I don't know all the details. I just have to trust people and hope that they, I mean, I can evaluate, I can ask questions and stuff, but at the end of the day, I have to hope that people are making the best decision for the firm, because intellectually, I'm not capable of making that assessment, or I don't have the time to actually go into the weeds with them and make that decision. Okay, so that's bounded rationality. This whole thing with search costs is really like bounded rationality. That's really what it is, right? The logic is just a little bit flipped, right? Whereas this is saying that I don't have time, I don't have the resources, I am not smart enough to figure this out, and I can be I as an individual entrepreneur, an individual manager, or an organizational I from the perspective of a firm. Or you can look at it in terms of I, again, same thing as an individual I or an organizational I, I um, don't have the time to get that optimal decision. I'm not, now search costs, I guess they don't really talk about intelligence in this thing, at least not to, not to my knowledge. And I don't really have the resources to devote to find that perfect supplier because of the fact that it's some sort of a financial constraint, right? I, may, I weigh my options and I say, you know what? For another five days, I could find that ideal supplier, but as I'm doing my calculations, it's not worth my time to spend another five days getting a slightly better supplier because I've got a good enough one within the allotted time period. So that's basically the relationship between these two concepts. So one is looking kind of internally at a decision-making process, and the other is basically weighing opportunity costs. That's the best way to look at it. Opportunity costs versus individual time, resource, cognitive limitations. I hope this helps uh, to my friend that uh, asked, this, uh, asked this question. If it's still not clear, um, you know, definitely drop me some comments and, and let me know what are the questions you still have. And for people that are watching this video uh, for the first time as well, I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you give me a like, that's a thumbs up. Subscribe, uh, make some comments below, and also subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.